Hello and welcome to episode 148 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week, a new book says we can solve the climate problem with existing technologies by 2035. And yet my Roomba still can't deliver a snack to me in my sofa without spilling it and then sweeping it up. Plant-based eggs have in some cases become cheaper than chicken's eggs. This is great news. However, many chickens are upset. Their jobs are being taken by lowly mung beans. Oh, there's a pecking order, Brian. Naysayers say the energy transition will mind the earth bare. But the truth will surprise you, especially if you're a naysayer. To that I say nay. General Motors is investing nearly a billion dollars for a new generation of V8 engines. Ooh. After that, they plan to ramp up their horse and buggy production. Also on this week's show, the Pakistan power grid goes down. And red states are benefiting most from new renewable jobs in the United States. All that and more on this week's edition of The Clean Energy Show. Remember a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, you, you told me to buy some Tesla stock because you thought, yeah. you know, it, it hit the bottom and uh you, you sure it, it was it had not you dead you, you it, was homeless I, what, what's going on yeah I, I bought it went way down well it's almost back up to where it was when i bought oh, it so God. that's the good news but this is the the, the bigger news i felt like i got the, you know hit the jackpot um i decided to order a tesla wall connector a home charger for my carport like i have a charger there but it's a generic one and i want the tesla one because it's got a button on the charger that opens the port and what took you, know, you so long brian you're just being cheap you're just saying now nah, i just bought this what, what, where, yeah, where's it coming I, from i'm just being cheap and you know when i put that one in my carport i hadn't even bought an electric car yet i was just trying to you know was the model three and, even on the market yet it was years away wasn't yeah, it yeah Maybe not. I had to wait a couple of years before uh, before I got, but I was doing the solar panels and everything at the same time. And so uh, I had them put in that. But anyway, so finally decided to get the, the Tesla charger. So we'll have two in the carport if we ever want to get two cars. And uh, right after I ordered it, they raised the price $110. Wow. Yeah. Lucky I felt Brian. like I hit the jackpot. I couldn't believe <laughs> You're it. You're $110 richer. Let's party. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was under 500 Canadian, which is a nice deal for those, but it's now it's closer to I 600. I bet it's a I demand think. issue because everybody's ordering Teslas and uh, yeah. the price has dropped. And so they probably have, uh, whoops, we didn't uh, anticipate the supply demand. Yeah. And, you know, the price on those has always been reasonable. So, um, you know, definitely they, they could have been charging more this, this whole time. Yeah. Also, so just before we started recording, um, the Oscar nominations came out today. Yes. So... I happened to look at them before we, we started. This was controversial anyway. in past years, you know, on our show, because I could yeah. discuss it that you didn't like any of the nominations. And I'm an Oscar guy. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend not to. But anyway, I bring it up because there's a Canadian movie nominated for Best Picture, which almost never happens. It's Women Talking, directed by Sarah Pauly. That is like legit a Canadian movie. I never saw it as a oh, Canadian movie. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's Frances McDormand is in it and she's one of the producers, but it's a legit Canadian movie. Shot here? Yeah. So you're going to have two car chargers in your carport. That means yeah. you're going to get an electrician who has to say, is there a panel space? Is there a panel space available with all you're doing? Well, there is because I did that upgrade to 200 that, amps. Right? And so I'm waiting for the induction cooktop to come in and I'm going to have them put both in on the nice. same day. So you keep us up to date on the price. Because I think people like to know stuff like that, you know? Yeah, for sure. Even though I'm sure you're going to get ripped off. So <laughs> I was looking at this, uh, the specs on the Tesla wall charger. If you have a 60 amp breaker for this circuit, and which means a big thick wire to go along with it that doesn't overheat with a constant draw, you can have 48 amps out, which works out to 11.5 kilowatts. Do you think you'll be any faster charging? When you put this in? Uh, no, my car is limited to 7 kilowatts. So really? um, other Teslas can go up to 11, though. Okay, so 7 kilowatts only requires 7.7, .7, I take it, or in the, the neighborhood? Um, yeah, something 40 like that. amp breaker with a 32 amp max output. So that's you need a 40 amp breaker. That's what I have. Yep. Uh, so my driveway is currently limited to that on my Nissan Leaf. And my Nissan Leaf only charges at 3.3, but we are looking at a bolt. And by the way, you know, I feel like I'm closer than ever to buying an electric car. I feel like if there was one available, I would have jumped on it. Yeah. You know, like well, it's... Well, this, this has been dragging on for a long time, but... Uh, the Tesla prices briefly came down in where we lived. At least uh, uh, the price of the online prices were 45000 for a Model 3s. 
that were, you know, two to three years old. Uh, yeah. That's pretty good, I think. I mean, considering you would make a profit yeah. on those. No, I think the supply of those of used Teslas is going to start ex increasing and the, the prices should come down. But they're back up. But is that... They're back up to 48 now, so... Oh, okay. <laughs> For what it's worth. <laughs> Short-lived, I guess. No, I mean, I think eventually they'll come down. But is that the right form factor for you? Like a hatchback, like the Bolt? It's not ideal, better. but that supercharging network yeah. and the cool factor. You know, I, yeah. I drive my kids <laughs> off at school. I, I need to have that cool. There's another Tesla there. There's a Y. I'll never compete with a Y. <laughs> well, the yeah. Y passes me by all smug when I'm there in my Leaf, my Nissan yeah. Leaf. Uh, yeah. The point is a lot of electric cars, though. We, 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 it's just amazing, like, how many there are. Because yeah. there was none. It's really... When yeah. we started the show, there was practically hardly any. When we started the show, I that was about was, when I got my Tesla. Just shortly after we started the show, my Tesla arrived, and there were hardly any on the streets. Like kids, it was would practically worth point. a phone call to see. I saw a Tesla <laughs> today. You know, I mean, it was that right. that important. And school kids would would point at me on the street uh, because of the the Tesla. But now, eh, no big deal. All right. So from General Motors. This is a rather depressing story about General Motors. General Motors have done quite a few good things in terms of switching to electric vehicles. You're thinking of buying a Chevy Bolt, which was an early electric vehicle. Those have been around for a few years now, decent range uh, electric vehicles. 2017. They, yeah. They keep saying that they're all in on electric vehicles. They're, they're planning to compete with Tesla. Anyway, so... They are investing $918 million in four of their facilities, and most of that money is going to V8 engine production for the next generation of V8 engines, which just seems bizarre. Because a lot of car companies have already put a stop to further combustion engine development. Yeah. This seems like a last gasp. And it also seems like they don't have any faith. I wonder if they would be doing this if they were at the same point where Ford is and they're seeing insatiable demand. Huge demand, for yeah. That, mm -hmm. that was, is never going to end. This is before it's even proven, before it's, you know, in people's neighborhoods. And, and being, this is demand from fleets and everything else that... Um, Electric vehicles, their their Silverado is coming, but I yeah. wonder if they would do that if they were in the same position because it seemed this is a bill almost a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a waste of money. It's a complete waste of money. And our friends, the Strake Pipes, they had a review just recently of the new Corvette Hybrid. So this sort of seems to be the kind of thing that they're investing this money in. So it, it seems like a very cool car, the new Corvette Hybrid. It's a, it's a V8 engine, but then there's an electric motor on the front. So the, the gasoline engine powers the back wheels and electric motor powers the front wheels. So you get incredible performance. It's, you know, zero to 60 in two and a half seconds kind of thing. And, you know, the straight pipes looked at it. I mean, it's a super cool car. It's, uh, but Oh, and I was going to mention, too, like I, I used to own a Nissan Leaf, and that was a configuration they used to have in Japan for the Nissan, or no. sorry, not the Leaf, the uh, the Cube that I owned, right. the Nissan Cube that I owned. In Japan, you could get one that was a hybrid like that with a gas engine powering either the front or, I think it was the front wheels, and then a little electric motor and a little battery that would power the back wheels to give you four-wheel drive. So um, this is a sort of a similar configuration. But the point being, too, that, you know, V8 engines, this is a mature technology. This has been around for 100 years now. We don't need any more development of it. We don't need another generation. They could, if they want to sell these Corvette hybrids with a V8, they could just keep using the V8 that they've got. They don't need to make another one. And that's what this in this weird, almost billion dollar investment is in. Well, you could tweak it maybe. I mean, they're going to need to make fuel economy improvements. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of where, and there's that, just that alone is like, you know, yeah. you, you better but, look out because the fuel economy policy from governments around the world is coming after you if you don't have V8s, and it's going to make it difficult. That's a billion yeah. dollars on the table. It makes me question their sanity. But also, too, if, if fuel economy is the thing you got to improve, you probably shouldn't be starting with a V8. You should be starting with a V6 or a four-cylinder turbo, something like yeah. that. Well, maybe the hybrid's the way to go. I don't know how the hybrids are, are working in trucks, but they, they do have... A lot of hybrid pickup trucks around. Yeah, like a lot of the super fast sport cars, uh, sports cars are hybrids now, and, and it does make for, you know, 
pretty cool performance and and uh you know you still get that engine sound which lots of people love but yeah you know it's uh it's it's these things have been developed for a hundred years and the advancements that we can make now are very very minute uh so why bother having said that i have read a lot of things recently about gasoline consumption and i'll touch on it later in the show i think the gasoline consumption is going oil consumption is going down and a lot of it has to do not with just the electrification, that's not really making a big mark yet. The biggest mark has been the Biden era, not the Biden era, but the Obama era that started with was the fuel economy, you know, improvements yeah. that had to be made. That is yeah. a, one of the, and people are driving a bit less now, thanks mm -hmm. to the pandemic. So yeah, we'll have a story yeah. on that later. But yeah, that's more that's people working on. at home. You know, I've been looking at the, uh, the Chevy Bolt. EUV. It's only, uh, see, the EUV comes with a free uh, 240 volt charger that you have to pay for mm. $450 for with the other, the regular bolt. So I mm. figure the difference in price, if I'm going to buy that anyway, is only like $1,800. So I'll probably go with the EUV. And they're making mostly EUVs, it sounds like people are, that's the one people are going for. It's a little, mm -hmm. a little, a tiny bit bigger, tiny bit different yeah. form factor. Looks a bit SUV-ish, but you know, there was there was one in a small town in Alberta that uh, was at a good price, but I I just can't get there and get it. So I do want to get that. And then the problem, Brian, is, and this is this is what's eating me. My Prius that my wife drives, we want to get rid of it, and it's selling at the dealership we bought it from, the same car with similar mileage, for. About an MSRP, like within a thousand dollars of MSRP, that's what it's listed at. Wow. And it's it's coming up on six years old. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. So I figure we've got a gold mine there, and that will help me get into an EV. I've got to unload it, but I can't buy an EV to do that. So where do I put my money? What is the gold equivalent in cars that I can just throw in money until I can get one available? I mean, is it like a is it a Tesla? Is it a yeah. Is it something else? Is it a combustion car with a good retail value? I mean, what, what am I going to do? Listen, have you heard of cryptocurrency? Yeah. I think that's an excellent investment. <laughs> I might as well put it all on red at the casino. I don't know. <laughs> that might work too. But I'm, I'm kind of pissed because GM Canada, they were offering uh, 10 years of connectivity. This is something they charge $150 a year for. Uh, just yeah. to be able to have remote app connectivity to your car, which is something we want and kind of expect. Yeah. But that was 10 years free. Now that's gone. It's $150 a year. Plus the um, the list price of the upcoming Chevrolet Equinox, which is a genuine crossover SUV, bigger, very popular vehicle. It is less than the Bolt. It's 37. Right. The Bolt is like 41 or, you know, 39, something like that, depending on how you configure it. So why would I, I – that means I know the price – of the bolt is coming down because it's not going to be the same and it's not going to be more. I know those two things because it's a small eco hatchback. So something's mm -hmm. got to give. That means I'm going to have a a bit of a stranded asset on my hands. But maybe maybe I take that because it could be two or three years before there's any supply of those to buy. But I would probably, that would be the one to buy. And I go, oh man, people are going to buy those like crazy. Yeah, you know, yeah. That's the form factor people want. And it's uh, it's got more horsepower. It's got... It's, it's even got a bit of a towing capacity. I mean, it's got all kinds of things. Like, uh, wow. yeah, they're going to want that. Brian, it's time for uh, a book report. Now, I don't have an intro for James's book report. Because you never thought you'd read another book? No, and I haven't. But The Guardian <laughs> did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> book report. This is, uh, yeah, it doesn't say Brian's book report. It's just book report. It's you singing. Yeah. Not anyone could use it, me. really, you know. Yeah. You want to use it in another podcast? Give us a call. We'll, we'll lend it to you. So The Guardian has a report on a book that's not out yet. It's out April 2nd. It's called No Miracles Needed. And it is by a fella that I've been following for a lot of years, very smart man, an academic at Stanford University in California named Mark Jacobson. And again, the title is No Miracles ne uh, Needed. A reference to Bill Gates, I think, said we need miracles. We need to develop miracles right. to solve the energy transition. And he says this is kind of a rebuttal to that. Poor Bill Gates. He said so many things that people come back later <laughs> and call him on. I'm surprised <laughs> we didn't get a call to write a blurb for the book because this is basically yeah. our show. This book is yeah. our show. This says... 
that we don't have time for anything else. The existing technologies, wind, solar, batteries of different kinds that are currently available, and even some of, some odd ones that he mentions, but they they are available, are all we need to solve the energy transition. We could actually do it, uh, like ninety five percent of it by twenty thirty five if we deployed what we have now. And then that yeah. also increases a mass deployment of these technologies that we have now and speeds up their improvement. We see wind turbines and solar panels improving with what they can output and their price uh, coming down. This speeds up with uh, a quick adoption of it. And so many people who listen to the show, and so many people who talk to me on the street and relatives, they all have their own pet fix. You know, my son, yeah. my damn bastard son. If you're listening, Aiden, he's like, oh, nuclear is great. You stick a rod in and it lasts for years. Yeah, but how much does it cost to build a power plant? Well, I don't know, but it lasts for years. <laughs> I'm sure he'll appreciate this uh, assessment. And that he's in engineering, so he's got all these other engineers with their own things, and they're kiboshing this and kiboshing that. And all engineers apparently have a, a thought on that. I was listening to a radio program, um, What on Earth, which is also a podcast on clean energy. And they were talking about different people about teaching uh climate classes in university and some of them were not climate people but they said they had a lot of engineering students and the engineering students all came to the table with their own thing it's like it's yeah. a problem that can be engineered a saw yeah, yeah. the solution can be engineered and, and they mentioned things like umbrellas in space yeah. you don't need to do that <laughs> you don't need to do that and god knows how that's more complicated than it sounds you know, and God knows when that would even launch if you did something like that. Mm -hmm. If that was the only solution, it would take, you know, 20 years at least. We don't have time. Jacobson has scores of academic papers to his name. I'm reading from The Guardian now. And he has been influential in policies passed by city, states, countries around the world targeting 100% green power. But he's also controversial, Brian. Uh, not least for pursuing a $10 million lawsuit against researchers who claimed his work was flawed, which he later dropped. But he is highly regarded and people do follow his policy. Uh, Bill Gates said we have to put a lot of money into miracle technologies, Jacobson says, but we don't. We have the technologies that we need. Wind, solar, geothermal, hydro, electric cars. We have batteries, heat pumps, energy efficiency improvements. We have the technology to do all this. We have 95% of the technologies right now that we need to solve the problem. The missing 5% is for long-distance aircraft and ships, he says, for which hydrogen-powered fuel cells can be developed. So, or whatever else we can get in the meantime. But that's that's the 5% of the 95 that's not, the 95 is solvable, it's energy. So, yeah. wind and solar are cheaper too. So, average bills will fall 63%, he says. That's a lot. Yeah. And not a bad thing. But if you buy nuclear, then it's... You know, it's up 63% or 163%. Yeah. This is stupid. Uh, Jacobson divides approaches to the energy transition into two camps. One says we should try everything. They're the all of above camp and every, and keep investing huge amounts of money in technologies that may or may not be available to work in 10 years, uh, like small nuclear reactors, according to our local government here. 10 years is too late Carbon emissions, and write this down, kids, if it's not in your brains right now, carbon emissions must fall by 45% by 2030 to keep on track for no more than 1.5 degrees of global heating. 45% by 2030, that's not frickin' umbrellas in space in 2060, people. This is a, a thing that can and needs to be solved right now. Jacobson says, let's focus on what we have to deploy and deploy it as fast as possible. And then we will improve those technologies by deploying them and the speed. Yeah, seven people, seven million people die every year from just air pollution, Brian, seven million. And that, why wait for that? Why wait for millions yeah. of people to die? Uh, storage can be batteries, pumped hydro, flywheels even, he says, compressed air. Because uh, these things exist and are proven, but I don't know how cheap they are. They'd have to come down a little bit in price, but they, they don't have to be developed. And lowering and raising heavy weights, uh, which is something we've also talked about on the show before. But uh, Jacobson thinks batteries will win because of cost. He says others would have to contribute. Perhaps they can contribute, but they'll have to compete on cost. So new research indicates that electric vehicle batteries alone 
alone could provide the short-term storage needed by global grids by as early as 2030. So people say, but, but the sun doesn't shine all day. Well, if everybody has an electric car, an electric bus, electric truck, and they're all plugged into the grid. Which brings us to a CS fast fact. The drilling and mining for the fossil fuels in the world every year consume 11% of all energy. That's just the drilling and the mining for fossil fuels. Well, not the burning of them, yeah. but the use of energy in the world, 11%, more than a tenth of it goes to just oil. And in terms of batteries, I mean, we still have to ramp up battery production and it is still ramping up and, and that will take some time. But yeah, in the meantime, you can make batteries out of pumping water up a hill, basically. I mean, there's there's other ways to, to do a battery. And other people have said we need solid state batteries in our cars, like these, you know, hypothetical solid state batteries would be better. And, you know, lots of people are pursuing that. But the fact is the lithium ion batteries we have now work just fine. We so don't, don't have to don't have delay that anything. Technology. Don't wait for solid yeah. state. Solid state will come. It could be here sooner than we but think. Don't it wait. might be 2030. It might be even later than that. But don't wait. Let's get going now. That's uh, that's a good point. Plant-based eggs are now becoming potentially cheaper than shell eggs. So this is a report from Bloomberg. And this is one of those stories that we're going to report on as these things you know, happen occasionally, but eventually this will be the norm, we believe. Um, these alternative plant-based foods will eventually, we think, all become cheaper than their, their um, you know, sort of animal-based um, alternatives. So, yeah, this is from Bloomberg. At the end of 2022, something strange happened in the U.S. egg market. On a per-unit basis, the price for plant-based eggs fell below those of chicken's eggs. And this had to do more with the price of chicken's eggs going up, you know, just the inflation that we've had. Um, so I've never tried plant-based eggs. It comes in a liquid form. Unfortunately, they don't make a nice little shell for you. That would be kind of fun. <laughs> That's asking a lot. A... <laughs> Are you really calling for that? Plant-based yeah, eggs yeah, and I'd shells? Go... <laughs> we need plant-based shells for it's eggs. Just, and, without and... the crack, and what's the point? Yeah. But um, so, yeah, it's it's a liquid egg um, and, it, you know, comes in a carton. You can also get uh, chicken's eggs in a carton as well, sure. as in just in liquid form. But um, anyway, the turns out the main ingredient in these things is mung beans, which is a thing I've really never heard no. of before. But better than dung beans. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I haven't been to the health food store in a long time. No. I, I mean, I'm assuming they might have them there and, and perhaps they do. We try I actually them. looked it up. There's two health food okay. stores in Regina, where we live, that have them, but just two. And they're obscure. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like uh, all vegan, vegan-based health food stores. So, yeah, yeah, we're not vegan. Are we? You're not. I'm not, no. But you do enjoy um, a vegan meal now and again, sure. Sure, why not? So one of these companies that makes them is called Eat Just, and they estimate that because it uh, that has, has saved 10.9 billion gallons of water and 16,000 acres of land use since launching their um, fake eggs, basically. Um, it estimates avoiding 52 million kilograms of carbon dioxide uh, emissions, it's like taking 11,000 cars off the road. So, you know, these are the implications for a lot of these plant-based foods is they're just far less um, energy and resource intensive than animal-based foods. And eggs are not nearly as bad as beef. But as I mentioned last week, I worked on an agricultural documentary for a summer when I was in university. And I spent time in chicken coops on farms. And I... yeah was not happy like like I'm not a no I'm not a pita person but my god yeah. that's not a good life for those and they were not happy they check they pick them the, their neighbors to death you know it's like you know it's it's bad Brian it's bad no and it it doesn't have to be that way but you know like gasoline cars spewing pollution all the time it's just been like this for so long that we just kind of accept it yeah but you need your shell don't you i yeah that's we just need so, a plant-based egg <laughs> when i saw this in the script i went looking on the internet for reviews and i noticed okay. they came the the what is it eat just came in a sort of a glass or plastic i don't know a glass or plastic bottle of like a liter it seemed like there was two portions if you wanted scrambled eggs you know you could make half of it would make one portion and the other half would be free part, and that would be it. So it seems like it's very expensive. And and this 
you know, the fact that they were cheaper than chicken's eggs, I think it's probably reversed since then. And, and it's now more expensive than chicken eggs. And this it depends, of course, on where you live yeah. and uh, the supply chain where you live. But, um, you know, in the long run, should be well, cheaper. Well, it seems that once these things take over, uh, they are, you know, once they gather momentum and, and there's going to be an S curve to the cost and adoption yeah. and the, you know, adoption goes up, cost goes down. Uh, I'm sure all those figures you stated are just, you know, tiny, you know, sales figures because they, they can't have sold more, you know, anything yeah. close to a grocery store. So it's, it's eventually going to, you know, move to other segments of the food industry and and be cheaper in all of them eventually. They even have some sort of uh, folded over product. I don't know how that works. I couldn't find it. But they have some, there's one that's liquid and then there's one that's folded over. And I don't know if those are refrigerated, you know, if they mm. come in the freezer section, but they're all, they're like, you know, folded over that you can throw right in the toaster or something, make an egg sandwich <laughs> okay. or something. <laughs> We've we got a new tea kettle the other day. Remember how my toaster has a keep warm function? Yeah. This tea kettle has a keep warm function. Wow. Again, more electricity use by James. You're living in the future I though. need more solar panels. And you know what? Yeah. My uh, daughter texted me yesterday from high school and she said her teacher was talking about her solar panels. She got 28 of them her first winter. They're all covered with snow because they're on a flattish roof, you know, like yours. Yeah. Mine too, yeah. Uh, and I'm having trouble getting rid of, like some of my snow is gone, but um, I have a more angled roof, so it it tends to go on warmer days, but it's been a, the worst winter yet for that sort of thing. Yeah. No, I've given up on winter production for my my panels. Yeah, but that does not affect, I told her that does not affect, you know, utility solar farms because the utility solar farms, yeah. at least around Canada, are on a single axis tilt. So when it snows, yeah. they tilt them either down or straight up and down so that it doesn't collect. So that works well. Uh, so I was watching, what was I watching? I was watching... Uh, Sunday morning television, and old Fareed Zakaria was on CNN, and he was talking to the president of Greece. And the president of Greece, uh, we don't, I don't follow Greek politics too closely, but you know, they were having some serious financial problems last decade, right? They were the mm -hmm. welfare case of the European Union and uh, getting lent lots of money. Now that's all gone. I didn't know that. You hear bad news, wow. but you don't hear that that's all gone. They've paid back all the debts pretty much because things are yeah. going so damn well for them. Now, they had a populist government, a left-wing populist government in uh, basically the same time Trump was. And then they replaced them with a right center-right governor, government rather, prime minister. And he is all in on the things you and I are in, you know, like, why can't wow. that be the case in our politics? Why, yeah. why is it a political issue? Why is it a woke issue? You're just, in, you're in fantasy land if you think that one form of energy that's uh, displacing others on cost alone, not on ethics or anything else, is a woke issue yeah. and it bothers you. But this guy was on CNN and, and, and you know, they've reached a hundred percent. Let's hear him. The green transition is also quite impressive. At this point, what percentage of Greece's electricity is produced from renewables? Close to 50 percent. And there were days, uh, you know, in, in October where for hours we produced 100 percent of our electricity from renewables. So when you look at, you know, to me, the, what's interesting about the Greek case is you have a center right government pro-market, uh, but as you say, responsible on green issues, also on uh, protecting the vulnerable. Um, is there a model here for how to stave off populism? I think the main cleavages today are not so much between the center-right and the center-left, uh, but between those uh, who believe in, uh, in, in, in policy uh, pragmatism uh, and, uh, you know, in a well-functioning democracies, uh, and those who promise uh, the moon while at the same time undermining democratic institutions. Oh, if we had that in Canada, that basic, or United States, Mm -hmm. The basic idea of not, no BS, like, of course it's good. Of course, yeah. it's like, they're that's one of the <laughs> big pillars of why they're out of debt is because they've gone all in on green energy. And yeah. that's, it's not the main reason, but it's one of, you know, several. And, oh man, I just, it's the, the political discussions here are just, I mean, you and I live are the worst ever, but I mean, it's, it's terrible. Yeah. It's super depressing, and I try not to pay too much attention because it just gets depressing. But you would think that a government on the right that is pro-market, to use the words from that interview there, pro-market should be pro-renewables because it's, it's the better business decision. Yeah. If you're not going renewables, then you're going against the market. You're wasting money. Um, 
Yeah, I just thought I'd throw that out there, Brian. A story from Pakistan. They've been having huge problems with their electrical grid in Pakistan. So this report here is from uh, the BBC. They've had power out in really all of their major cities, uh, Karachi, Islamabad, uh, Lahore, Peshawar. This has been, you know, a huge problem. It sounds basically like it's a infrastructure problem. Their their grid is just not particularly robust, and it's uh, it's kind of falling apart. But uh, Pakistan would probably do well to follow the example of Greece, because Pakistan generates most of its power using imported fossil fuels. It's one thing to burn fossil fuels, especially when you can just dig them up, you know, in the yard next door or down south here in Saskatchewan, we dig up coal and burn it, which is a terrible thing to do, but at least we don't have to import it. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so, yeah, so most of their power comes from imported fossil fuels. Just imagine the, the drain on the economy that is to spend all that money on all that fuel. And as global energy prices have increased in the last year, further pressure has been put on the country's finances and its foreign reserves, which it needs to pay for energy imports. So, um, yeah, 12 hours, last I heard, you know, in these major cities, massive power outages. So uh, hopefully they can uh, get this sorted and, and start moving towards clean energy that they don't have to import. And in the lightning round, I'm going to have a story about South Africa having similar problems uh, due to an aging uh, coal plants. But, you know, it, people say, well, uh, Mark Jacobson said in his book that uh, some grids can hand already handle 100%. I mean, you know, yeah. you see memes going around and say it can only handle 5, 20% or something like that. Well, some grids can handle 100% already without hardly any modifications. And some yeah. grids will need modifications, but it's a, it's a learning process that we have plenty of time to do in the next seven years as we deploy renewables. Yeah. And, and speaking of that polarization, which is so depressing to read in the news, but, you know, we're in this situation where you just know that, People are hearing about, you know, Pakistan's problems and probably blaming them on, you know, clean energy or the wind not blowing. And whereas, you know, the other side of the argument is blaming it on fossil fuels. And, uh, you know, you can look out there on the Internet and find whatever view there is to support your view if, if the, that's the way you do it. Well, there's one set of people who will make money off of this and create jobs. And there's the other set will just sit there and complain and live in a fantasy world. But the fact is, clean energy rules the day already, and it's going to get way, way more power. Brian, it is time for the coveted segment, the Tweet of the Week. Yes, this is where I have a, a tweet highlighted. Twitter, you know, that thing that people used to go on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of misinformation on the net from a Twitter thread shared by tens of thousands of people many times claiming that basically we're going to rape the earth of all of its minerals if we do the clean transition that is necessary to get to net zero. So therefore, we should just give up and uh, let the earth burn and our children die yeah. in uh, float <laughs> off in an iceberg. <laughs> So, uh, yep. yeah, this is a tweet from uh, Visa Sklakinian. And also, he's, he's just pointing out information that is available out there. And he does a, a rebuttal, a multi, you know, threaded rebuttal to uh, this. And a lot of my climate people, including Mark Jacobson, and have retweeted this. Uh, so I take that as an endorsement that it's good information. So if we assume the positive option that transition will work and it'll take the next 27 years to get there, uh, and require 50, you know, 3 billion tons of uh, minerals, the transition will only average 3.4% uh, more minerals to the annual mineral, mineral production. So this is, this is combating the idea that's going around that everything we mined in human history so far will be needed for the green transition, that this is going around. So there's a lot of people who believe this, and they'll continue to believe it. Uh, the fact is, it's not true. 3.4% more than what we are already putting out there now to do that. So it's it's still a big deal. You know, that's not yeah. an easy thing. And it's still a grand project of the worldwide proportions to do this. But it's 3.4%. It is not impossible, A. It's definitely not impossible. And B, 
uh, it's not going to wreck the planet. And a lot of these minerals, I mean, we're seeing recycling of uh, wind turbines and solar panels already. Imagine what it'll be like 50 years from now when they get good at it, when they have a reason to recycle them and a profit yeah. margin to do it. And batteries, chemical batteries, um, are looking good for electric cars. Like there's the, it's going to, it's a high amount now. It's going to get higher, and that'll be the cheapest way to get new minerals for new batteries is to recycle the elements in those batteries, the rare earth elements, which they can do. And they're just starting, and they're already pretty darn good at it. And I'm just going to mention an article here I've mentioned before. Hannah Ritchie has a Substack called Sustainability by Numbers. And she looks at these issues in terms of data and statistics and numbers and uh, posted one on January 18th about this very issue. And um, the title is Mining Quantities for Low Carbon Energy is Hundreds to Thousands of Times Lower than Mining for Fossil Fuels. So you were talking earlier about, you know, how much energy we, just the energy we spend. I know, it's crazy. It it's up. stupid. And the land use. Yeah. Remember, we talked about land use in recent shows. It's a fraction it, of what fossil land, fuels use yeah. now. It's it's already and more yet, land oh, no, use than we, we need. We can't, you know, make something new. Well, <laughs> oil is fine. You know, we can build steel structures for oil and, and mine them out of the ground and transport them and burn them and refine them. But... Not anything new. No, we, we can't. But putting up a solar farm, that's a bridge too oh, yeah, far. that's crazy. That's just, just, this call it stupid would be giving it a compliment. Yes. That's a CES fast fact. 40% of U.S. corn grown on the area of a size of England. So 40% of U.S. corn is used for ethanol production. And that is the size, it takes up the size of England, which is a wow. waste. We don't like ethanol here in the show. Or my yeah. our local refinery, mere kilometers away from me, certainly within nose range, mm -hmm. is switching to ethanol and, and different things. Well, imagine if they used an area the size of England and uh, filled it with solar panels and wind turbines. It'd be amazing. It would be amazing. <laughs> and it would probably power the world. Uh, nuclear power is switching off wind farms in Scotland. I'm going to touch on this story. The operation of nuclear power plant, a nuclear power plant in Scotland, is being blamed for the large amounts spent on compensating wind farms. Why? Basically because they can't shut down the nuclear plant when the wind starts producing. This right. is a problem. This is a problem yeah. with nuclear. Mixing in with renewables because renewables have up and down days. And some of those days, yeah. they're going to give that electricity away and they're going to make green hydrogen with it and other things. Yeah, so you, you can't shut down nuclear. So you, what do you do? They're compensating wind farms. And asking them to shut down. Asking them to shut down and paying the money. And that raises the costs of electricity. So, yeah, man, storage. We need more storage. So the operation of nuclear uh, nuclear power plant in Scotland is uh, blamed for the large amounts of money being spent compensating the national grid. Had to shut down production of the wind farms, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm just going to leave it there. We're going to we're going to start seeing stuff like this. Yeah, and as we've said before, uh, nuclear can be good baseload power. But not if it's not flexible. It's just not flexible enough. And here's the thing. The more cheaper, clean energy there are coming onto the mix makes the nuclear um, more expensive because then you have to go from 90% capacity to 80 to 70 to 60 to 50 because everything else, you know, they can't do it overnight, but as the mix yeah. gets larger, the nuclear goes down. Yeah. And then you have to pay the wind farms to shut down because they can only go down a certain level on their production. Now, I've got a tweet here that I uh, sent out last week that was about, from Bloomberg, how it's going with um, electric um, transportation, okay? 3.8%, this is worldwide, are now light commercial vehicles. Passenger cars are currently at 13%, which is kind of at a tipping point. Two-wheelers, you might be interested to know, are at 39%. And we really can see different uh, companies uh, innovating with that and the price coming down. I think that's going to... I, I'll bet that'll push 60% next year and we'll get into 75% the year after. Like, it's going to take off yep. fast. And buses, to my surprise, are at almost at 50%. They're at 49%. All the new buses being made, 49% of them are battery electric in the world right now. Right now. That's amazing. And, oh, to have a world with non-diesel buses that don't make noise. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful world. I hope I live long enough to see it. It shouldn't be too long. Yeah. Brian from CNN, South Africa, coal, which, you know, coal in South Africa supplies 80% of their electricity, is the uh, 
is an unreliable electric, electricity source, apparently, because it's causing blackouts 205 days last year of blackouts. That's worse than Pakistan. And every day yeah. in 2023 so far, every day when this was written a week ago. So blackouts, this is from CNN if you want to go look at the story. Blackouts due to an inherent unreliability of coal power station fleet. The reason is they haven't taken care of the coal power stations. A lot of countries yeah. haven't taken care of their electrical infrastructure. No, and they're all just getting old. A lot of them were probably built 50, 60 years ago. And yeah, they're just super old. And the time has come. And, you know, oh, speaking of the time coming, it is time for the lightning round. This is a weekly fast-paced look that we uh, end the show with looking at the headlines of clean energy and climate news. Can you believe that the show is coming to an end already? Political says GOP lawmakers voted in mass against Biden's signature IRA bill. This is the big Inflation Reduction Act bombshell act that came down last summer thanks to good old Joe Manchin, friend of the show, who approved it. And yes, all kinds of billions and trillions are going towards a lot of good things. But get this, two thirds of the green energy projects announced so far since it became law, where are they going? They're going to Republican held congressional districts that voted against it. Isn't that just a pisser? Yeah, interesting. The only good news about that I see is that they won't be able to shut it down. You know, this is one, yeah. this is, this will keep it permanent, which will save our lives, our hides. Yeah. And they won't be able to shut yeah. it down when they get into power. E bike battery theft is a growing concern in the Netherlands. It went up 300% last year. More e-bike batteries are coming fitted with GPS tractors. Uh, bikes themselves are coming, but not the batteries, actually. But you, people can put, like, um, Apple AirPod, what are the, no, Apple... Uh, yeah, uh, air, tags. air tags. on them. Uh, some, I know my bike batteries, you can't really open it. They don't want you to open it and do something to it and burn down your house. But there mm -hmm. might be a way to, to, to get one in there. I don't know. Uh, mine locks onto my bike, has an actual key. I don't know, but I still don't trust it, you know, because it's like $350 plus tax. Yeah, you might be able to get it off with a crowbar or something like that. <laughs> India has started work on, get this, a one gigawatt battery storage facility at two adjacent sites. They're both half a gigawatt. And they're being built. That is a... We <laughs> this is... This is... Uh, I can't remember which site this was from. It was from... Um, from an, an Indian newspaper, this should be a huge story, you know, but one gigawatt, that is a nuclear power plant worth of yeah. batteries in one fell swoop, just, just boom, like that. And the they had a, auctions on it last spring, and it's getting built now. In April, they were having auctions, and the winning developer gets to keep 40% of the storage to itself to seek revenue opportunities. That was part of the deal. So they huh. get to sell that electricity uh, and make some money off of it, I guess, uh, during peak times and things like that. So Tesla has leaked the Magic Dock CCS adapter ahead of its opening opening in, um, its supercharger network to CCS adapters. Now, uh, all Teslas use a proprietary adapter, right? Like the one you're buying. In North America, in North America. they do, yeah. And now they are opening it up to people who maybe drive a Chevy Bolt or a Ford Mustang Mach-E or something like that. Every yeah. other car uses CCS. Uh, but they don't have the connectors there. You can buy one, but the, the interesting thing to me is that they seem to have come up with a way to know who you are when you come up and, you know, you'll have to use a, a card or something to plug into your um, thing. They'll know you're not a Tesla driver, like, a, you know, an electronic card or your phone app or something like that um, to, to initiate it, and they'll know that you need a CCS adapter. So the, a CCS adapter will automatically apparently lock on to the end of the Tesla. But if you're a Tesla driver, it won't. It'll just come out yeah. of the stall and you won't have that thing on the end. Yeah, on the Tesla superchargers, normally you just pull it out from where it's held and you plug it in. But they've added this adapter, and this is not official yet. It's it's just sort of been leaked. But they've added this adapter and sort of pushed it up into that same hole where you're, um, where it sits normally in the charger. And yeah, I guess, yeah, depending on your car, you'll either get just the Tesla one or the adapter will come with it. You could get them to put it on, right? But these things are worth four or $500 usually, at least retail. Yeah. So they don't want to mm. lose those. I mean, every every Yahoo with a, a Chevy Bolt yeah. will steal it and then 
I'll yeah. use this at my next Tesla adapter and everything will be fine. And you want an elegant solution. You don't necessarily want these things like dangling from a chain or something like that. Um, so this sounds like it's a more elegant solution, although potentially more complicated. So, you know, hopefully it actually Chains works. can be cut. Yeah, Ooh, that's true. Chains can be cut. Is that another CES fast fact sneaking up on us? Uh, globally, Brian, there are on average eight people for every car in circulation. That's globally. Hmm. And here's another one. Another CES fast fact. In the second quarter of 2022, Texas had three times more wind, solar, and battery storage under construction than California. Not the same, not close to three times as much as California. That's amazing. And Politically very different states, with... Brian. I'll point that out. Yeah, but it's a very much a free market type of grid that they have there. And so those who are pro-market and pro-business are perhaps seeing an opportunity there. Uh, this is from New York Times opinion columnist David Wallace Wells. He says on Twitter, showing a single digital ad to a single user involves on average emitting between roughly a tenth and a whole pint of carbon di dioxide. A tenth hmm. of a pint to a whole pint of carbon dioxide. Uh, informed estimates suggest as many as 400 billion ads appear online every day. <laughs> Not so many on Twitter right now. That's a little frightening. Polyculture. Polyculture. This is the idea of mixing two very different kinds of agriculture into one. So a polyculture of wheat grown, this is wheat that we have here in the Canadian plains where we live, uh, for making bread and grain, you know, stuff like that. Um, flour, uh, combined with walnut trees of all things, which we don't have here and can't have due to weather, produces 40% higher yields. 40% higher by combining these, these two weird things. It's like peanut butter and yeah. chocolate, Brian. 40% more pleasure. <laughs> So the, you got the trees in rows, and then the wheat goes between them, it looks like, from the picture here. Yeah, that's right. And enough for a large combine to go through. So, yeah, it's one point one hectare of wheat slash walnut mix yields the same as 1.4 hectares of uh, each crop grown separately. And there's different reasons for that. The, the trees are more spaced out, so they grow bigger. And, yeah, yeah just the water management of it all and, and it just works out really well yeah but and the light can still get through but also i think sometimes i have to worry about the wheat getting burned because there's too burned much sun. And blown and all kinds of protections yeah there's a lot of nuances to it and this is uh new but it could affect the climate if you're getting more out of the same land right uh, another CES fast fact. Boy, we're chock full of them this week. Uh, even if all cars sold in the United States today are EVs, it will take an estimated nine years for EVs to replace just half the cars on U.S. roads, according to the Fossil, or pardon me, the Fuels Institute. Bloomberg Intelligence says that in the second half of 2023, we expect plant-based dairy sales to rise six to eight percent. So dairy, remember, a lot of people are saying, and we have a dairy farmer and listeners to the show, that dairy is mm -hmm. going to go bankrupt, traditional dairy, by 2030. That might be the first of these to go. Yes, dairy would be, dairy is anticipated to be the first to go because you, I think it's only like 1% or 2% or maybe 3% of milk is actual milk. The rest is water yeah. and fats and sugars, which can be easily added. So they expect sales to rise six point. Meat alternatives, though, are only one point two percent, one to two percent rather, and yeah. they're not doing very well. And part of that is inflation, uh, because people there's a premium to pay for that, so people are, aren't opting for that anymore. They're kind of scared of that now. But yeah, yeah there's been a lot of hit pieces on Bloomberg, Brian, from the same writer <laughs> on uh, plant based meats. But they're, the stocks are doing terrible right now. Yeah, and perhaps we'll have to come out of this quasi-recession that we're in for all of this stuff to uh, truly take off again. Yes, and then once once they do, the prices uh, will displace real meat, and hopefully they'll start improving it as well. You know, there's no reason to believe there won't be constant improvements to the taste and texture to meet consumer preference. But I noticed that our Tim Hortons restaurants in Canada don't seem to be selling plant-based um, sausages for their burger, you know, their hmm. retro sandwiches and things like that anymore. It was only a six month experiment, apparently. I haven't found anything official on that. If anybody knows, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. Nat Bullard from uh, Bloomberg, an important chart from the Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, speed of primary energy supply growth. Uh, this is from when a energy uh, maker, like coal, for example, goes from one exajoule to 10 exajoules, basically 
getting off the ground to uh, the first benchmark. It took 51 years for coal to reach one, to reach 10 exajoules of energy, to go from one to 10, okay? 34 for oil, gas, 32, and wind, just 13, and solar, even less, 10. So 10 years for solar to get to what took coal 51 years to do. Yeah, that uh, that should tell people something. And if we use larger benchmarks with the price coming down, it's going to be crazy. That is our time for this week. That's our show for this week. We thank you for listening. We always appreciate you listening. Take the time to contact us, as I said, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. We're on TikTok. We're on YouTube. Uh, where aren't we? Everywhere. Clean Energy Pod is our handle. If you're new to the show, subscribe on your podcast app. And you know what? It's time to ask for people to please rate and review us on your podcast app, be it iTunes or wherever you are. Uh, Five-star review, four and a half if you don't like Brian too much. You know, something like that. <laughs> Brian, you, you took that hard. I could see you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he'll be back. Five stars only, please. Brian will be back next week. Uh, we'll see you then. See you next week.